very happy you're here with us for one of the first sessions of GVCC 22. Please remember that this session is meant to be informational, but any medical decisions should be made with your healthcare team. We are not a medical team right here. We welcome you to join as you are today, however is comfortable for you. I'm going to hand it over to Pastor Jackson. Um, as Ali said, I am uh, Pastor J.D. Jackson, Pastor Julius D. Jackson Jr., to be specific, a local pastor here in Rochester, New York. Um, I uh, was diagnosed with prostate cancer the early part of this year, and uh, it has been an interesting ride, um, but based on some of what I've heard from others, it hasn't been as bad as it could have been. Um, I, I actually had a, a, a better experience than a lot of folks that I, I, I know, um, but uh, I'm cancer-free at this point on my journey. Um, after having uh, surgery, and uh, it was, I, I didn't have a lot of um, caregiver support at the time, and that was by my choice. There were people who offered the help, but uh, being the independent person that I am, I uh, so, somewhat refused it. So, um, if I had it to do over again, I, I would accept the help, but. Um, Question, Pastor, may I ask you something? What sure. stage were you in? Um, stage three, I believe. Yeah, they, on the Gleason scale, it's measured a little differently than the other cancers, I believe. So, yeah. So on the Gleason scale, it was like a three. Um, I, I don't know if that was uh, my my full time of introduction, but I wanted to hand it off to our other speakers to give a quick introduction, if, unless there's other questions for me. So I'm Gail Valens, and my husband was um, in May of 2018, we were told he had an elevated PSA, and we needed to have a biopsy, yeah. which we had in July. And well, he had in July, I keep saying we, but it seems like it happened to me too, even though it was just him. Um, in August, we were on vacation and got the good news that he had prostate cancer. So um, we went worldwide of seeing doctors, talking to different people, having different tests done. And he was scared. We decided on surgery rather than radiation. Um, we he had his surgery in October, uh, actually October 15th. And that was really complicated by the fact that my father was dying of cancer at the time and I was a caregiver for him too. And so we were dealing with, I, on Wednesday I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. On Thursday, my father went into hospice. On Friday, my father passed away. And on Monday was my husband's surgery. And when we went to go to surgery, we went out to go to the hospital and we had a flat tire. It was like one thing after boom, boom. I just felt like it was like one thing after another, after another. And the week prior to that, my husband had had a bee sting, which we didn't know he was allergic to. And he was all swollen up. And so we didn't know if that was going to delay surgery or not. And then they told us there was a problem with his heart too. And so he had to go through all kinds of testing before that. That turned out okay. Um, so currently his PSA, we have to have tested every six months for five years. And then I guess yearly after that, fortunately he is fine. His cancer is doing fine. Uh, excuse me, he doesn't have cancer anymore. He's free of cancer. So that's really good. And I'll pass it on to who's ever next. My name is Stacy Winger and I am the caregiver to my husband, uh, Brian Winger. And in 2019, at the age of 37, uh, he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Um, it's actually not his first uh, run-in with cancer. And in 2009, he was diagnosed with colon cancer. Um, he has a genetic G mutation called Lynch syndrome, which puts you at higher risks for uh, certain kinds of cancers. Uh, we pretty immediately went on the hormone uh, treatment uh, which stripped his body of the testosterone. Uh, and then he started eight weeks of radiation. And in August, uh, he had the, of 2019, he had the, the prostatectomy um, because of the 
previous surgeries, which I'll get into uh, later, um, there was a, a great amount of scar tissue. So we knew going in uh, to the surgery that there's a possibility that they wouldn't be able to get it all. Um, and we found out afterwards that they weren't able to, uh, to get the, the, um, all the cancer cells. Uh, so he's continuing on the hormone treatment. He had his last dose in August of this year. You can only be on it for three years and then they have to take you off for a certain amount of time for your body to wake up and start producing testosterone again. Uh, so right now we're in that wait and see game as far as when the body starts producing that testosterone again and whether or not uh, we did uh, clear out the cancer or if it's still there. Okay, my name is Regina Hoover. And in May of 2020, my husband was unable to urinate. So of course we found a urologist and as part of his um, procedure in order to clear, um, he had the BPH, the old man's disease. We're, in our, we're both in our 70s, so we're older. And because of the BPH, they did an automatic test for cancer and he was diagnosed with stage four Gleason nine prostate cancer, the worst of the worst. And the problem with that was he had been tested every year for PSA and his PSA never went above number two or number four. So apparently the PSA in his system just wasn't a good indicator. So by stage four cancer, uh, the oncologist immediately put him on androgen de deprivation therapy, the same as uh, I believe Gail's husband was on, not Gail, I'm sorry, uh, androgen deprivation therapy, um, which he's been on for two years. He just stopped one drug and he switched to another drug. The thing about his cancer is he has severe side effects from the androgen deprivation. The lack of test testosterone has caused him to have severe hot flashes, tiredness, and brain fog. And th these are the issues that are, that are bothering us currently. It's very difficult for him to deal with, but he's, he's doing his best. And for two years, we've been monitoring how his cancer has been going. He had metastases into his spinal column, which is not good news either. So apparently the androgen therapy worked, the androgen deprivation therapy worked because we had him checked in June 15th and all his mets were gone. And he has only two spots left in his prostate. He was too late to have the prostate removed because it, it had metastasized throughout his body into his bone, all his bones, most of his bones. He had 22 mets to start with. And the fact that the, the therapy he was on eliminated the uh, mets was, was fabulous. We were very happy with that. But the side effects are still killing him. And the new drugs he's on, which is a, a different drug, but same type of therapy, still gives him the same side effects. So it, we're dealing with it. It's two years of dealing with, with a lot of issues. And, and I've helped, as his caregiver, I've tried to, to help him by attending appointments with him and taking notes or sometimes even recording the appointments because it helps to have that information and it helps to have another party. That's, that's the one thing I recommend for everybody who ever has a, a partner who has cancer of any kind, I would suggest, because I'll tell you what, my husband's issues were, he heard the word cancer and he heard nothing else for about four months <laughs> except the word cancer. And then you kind of like go into this shock syndrome, which is what happened to us. We both went into shock. We were just like, wait a minute, this man has never been, he's 78 years old. He has never been sick in his entire life. No childhood diseases, never been in a hospital, never, never been to a doctor except for his yearly checkups. And here he is getting cancer out of the blue at, his, at this late stage. So that's, based, that's our story. Thank you, Regina. Um, did anybody else want to share your, any more of your story on being a caregiver? And With uh, Brian, he was, his Gleason was a Gleason um, seven. 
Um, and I believe that was a comparable to, I believe a stage three, I could be quoting that um, incorrectly. That was my struggle too, uh, the Gleason versus the- The converting, oh, yeah. Right, so. Yeah, so how were um, decisions made? Uh, I guess this is a bit of a question for, for everyone. Um, did you uh, all commiserate before you um, decided on surgery versus radiation versus what other treatments you had? May I speak? Sure, Regina. We made no decisions. The, the, the oncologist determined that the only thing she, she wanted to do with him was put him on the ADT, the androgen dep deprivation therapy. So there were no decisions involved. And we, and we also found that there was very few resources nor support from either the oncologist or anything else. So we started looking for our own support system, which meant we went online and did the research. And there's a lot of information out there and there's a lot of support systems out there, but you gotta dig. Yeah. So now he's a member of a group of men that meet weekly that all have stage four, prostate cancer, they're on different medications, different uh, systems, but there are a lot of challenges with each type of drug that you're on, we've, we've learned. And the more we learn, the less we know. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like there's constant newness in prostate cancer, which is good news. There's something new coming out constantly. There's new drugs, new test procedures, new MRIs, and I won't even get into them because there's just so many of them. Um, the problem that we've had is our mental health, trying to adjust to the fact that he has cancer and who knows how long his lifespan will be. He's, he's, an, old, el he's an elder person and I'm an elder person. You know, I'm hoping, I told him, here's what I want, want from the cancer. I says, you must live 10 more years. So do everything you can to keep alive. Yeah. That's my rule of thumb. And then I help them as best I can. I put them on better diets, uh, plant-based diets, um, no red meat, those kinds of things, which really improved his, how he feels. And I've also required, I bought him a, a, a mountain bike so that he can bicycle around the neighborhood and get some exercise. And I bought him weight so he can get some exercise because exercise and diet are key to surviving. And I ought to know because what you're looking at is the lame taking care of the sick and the sick taking care of the lame. 23 years ago, I had a brain aneurysm, a brain bleed. And I'm hemiplegic, so I have to do what I can, the best I can. And I know he's told me he, well, his one concern is if he dies first, it's, it's a race right now to see who's going to die first, him or me. If, he says if he dies first, he's going to worry about me. Who's going to help me out and take care of me because I cannot function alone. So it's, it's a difficult er, area that we're in. On top of learning a new language with new drugs names that nobody can pronounce unless you, you, you mangle it up pretty thoroughly. But between learning the new language and trying to understand the background and how the cell, cell structures work and everything, it's basically learning a whole new skill. And we're getting better at it. After two years, we're getting much better and over and over. And my husband who was diagnosed, Regina, I 100% agree with you. You are in shock. And the, just the word cancer is so frightening. And I'd gone through that rodeo before because my daughter had colon cancer at age 25. And I mean, we were just really shocked by that because we had to go to five or six doctors before we had anyone that we even test her for it because she didn't fit any of the criteria for it. So for us, um, and that was a scary, scary time. We thought we were going to lose her. And then to have my dad diagnosed with cancer and then to have my husband diagnosed with cancer at the same time. And I, I just felt like I was being hit a lot. And we have a very strong faith. So we prayed a lot about everything that was going on. Um, and that's probably the only thing that kept me sane throughout that in my family. We had a lot of family support. Being a caregiver, um, I, want, I agree with you, Regina, Regina, as far as you need someone there taking notes and you need someone talking with you because you forget. Now, I don't, we, we get home, we'd say, he'd say, what did he say? What did the doctor say? 
you're not just pro you're not processing it very well. And so I think it's important to have someone there with you. That would probably be my biggest piece of advice. Have someone there with you if you can throughout the whole process. As a caregiver, it's it's hard for me to say my husband or my daughter or my father had cancer because it affects the whole family so much. It's it's something that we had cancer we were dealing with. It was the whole family is dealing with it. And um, my son came over when my daughter had cancer, cleaned up everything in the house completely as far as even the handrails and everything because her white blood cell, she went through chemo and everything and her white blood cell count would be down so low. So he came up and made sure that everything she touched would be sanitized while we were taking her to chemo the first time. And with my husband, we have a two story home. And after the surgery, it was very, very, the stairs were difficult for him. Lifting his foot to get over the, into the tub was difficult. Luckily, we just finished the week before having our tub changed into it just a walk-in shower. And we were doing that just because we were getting older and we wanted, we're trying to make our house very friendly as we get older. Um, my husband is 71 and I told him, you better live another 30 years. So <laughs> I wanted him to have a long time. Um, you have a higher goal than I do. 10 years would make me happy. 20 would make me ecstatic. <laughs> you know, I'm jealous though. You have a great support system, Gail. You've been surrounded very closely by cancer, but you have a great family support system. And I'm assuming some neighbors, I have none. The nearest family I have is 1500 miles away. And the same with my husband's, they're over 2000 miles away. Some of them are in different countries. So we have no family nearby. And I lost eight friend, close friends in the last two years, either to cancer or to COVID. So I've lost most of the people surrounding us that uh, I could count on. So it's Russ and I, it's my husband and I, it's just the two of us. And that gets, gets to be, we got, we've gotten to be a lot closer emotionally because of that. And we try to support each other as much as we possibly can. And then the men's support group that he joined, and I have joined caregiver support groups and that makes a huge difference. I learn more from the care, other caregivers than anywhere else. Cause they speak English. They don't speak doctorese. I definitely agree with you guys as far as it being just an extreme uh, emotional roller coaster and experiencing every single one of those emotions very intensely. Um, I knew first entering the relationship with Brian that this was going to be a, a pretty medically complex journey that we would be um, embarking on together with previously having colon cancer that resulted in uh, a, a permanent colostomy bag and then the prostate cancer and due to the, the medical complications with that, it ended up with a uh, permanent suprapubic cap. So it's a cap that goes straight into uh, the bladder. And uh, I am a, a mental health therapist uh, at uh, Fort Riley here in Kansas. And I preach every day about honoring where you are emotionally and uh, remembering yourself that this is two people going through this healing journey uh, together, but I didn't always heed my own advice. Um, I actually struggled with the word caregiver for quite a while. Um, I, Brian, you know, thankfully uh, didn't lose any of the capacity to, to perform any activities of daily living. He was still uh, able to work. He had a wonderful company that allowed him to work from home uh, permanently. The only time I felt myself more comfortable with the term caregiver was in the hospital, all those hospital stays, and then immediately following with the post hospital with uh, it wasn't uncommon for Brian to come home with uh, dr uh, wound drains, uh, with catheters, with, with a wound vac. And so helping him with the bathing and the, and the maintenance with, with all of those things um, really helped me uh, be okay with being a caregiver. But once that was done, um, I felt myself being back to that uncomfortable level of, of being called that. Um, I had to take a step back and really break down the word care giver. I was giving care and what I thought was just honoring my uh, wedding vows is in sickness and in health was 
caring for somebody in that caregiver role. Pastor, were you, did you have a caregiver? Um, I had an offer of caregiving that I rejected, uh, nicely rejected, but <laughs> rejected nonetheless. Um, just because of my level of independence, I, I, I felt I could, you know, handle things on my own. And, and again, my, my experience was a little better, um, like I said, than, than most, um, for, from my standpoint anyway. Um, someone else may say it was rougher than <laughs> others, but, you know, I, I wanted to handle this myself, especially, again, it being um, a, a more sensitive area <laughs> of cancer. Uh, my, my caregiver uh, offer was my mother actually. So um, just having to go through um, that discussion with her <laughs> above and beyond what, you know, I felt comfortable with, you know. You know what I found facilitate a good I, caregiver relationship. I but, go ahead, Regina. What? Do you know what I found interesting? What's that? You lose all embarrassment. There's yeah. No, more, no, no <laughs> further embarrassment available to us. Yeah, I didn't like and, and, and I'm growing into that as well. Um, again, when I started, it was kind of like, it, it was a shock for me to even um, ha have this happen to me. Um, with my experience, I had been getting the, the PSAs done regularly and they were always normal. Um, somewhere along the line, I was even discouraged from doing it. Um, it was stated, oh, you don't have any history in your family. Why are you doing this? Your numbers are always low. Don't worry about it. And everything was fine until it, it wasn't. And, uh, you know, ha had no uh, um, indication of anything going wrong before, you know, they, they tested the PSA and it, it was too high. So, you know, Regina, yeah. you, must, you mentioned something about yeah. your husband was really healthy until he wasn't, that you yeah. got this diagnosis. That's the way I felt about my husband. He had been really healthy. He was the one, I was the one that had health issues. He was the one that had no health issues. And then all of a sudden, boom, this hit. And it's a shock to you in other ways too, almost security too. It feels like a shock that way too, that um, he's the one you depended on for everything, at least I, I do for my husband. And then now I had to be the one that he had to depend on. And um, it was it was hard, that part of it was hard. I didn't mind helping him at all. I was scared to death about having to help him with his catheter afterwards, but it, it wasn't a big deal. Like I thought it was gonna be, and it was for a week. And so I was okay with that. I think he was less okay with that than I was that I had to help him with it. And like you mentioned, Pastor, it, it, the kind of subject it is, I think it's different when it's between husband and wife a little bit, but I think right. it also the pride, the male ego, that was really hard for him to one, give up. He's always taken good care of me and have to give that up. And maybe if, if, having to allow me to take care of him, I think was very hard for him. Yeah. Um, my kids offered to go, my daughter especially offered to go with us to the appointments. And I said, no, I don't think so. Um, just because of the subject and everything and the questions we wanted to ask, I didn't feel comfortable with my daughter being there. Her standpoint was we were there with her through everything and she knew a lot about, because she works for GRIT, she knew a lot about different kinds of cancer and that, but we still weren't comfortable with that. Although we knew that, you know, my son, my kids were there, my parents, my mom was there, my, uh, you know, my siblings were there if we needed the help. So, yeah. and, and as far as processing things, I couldn't process my dad's death because I was too busy helping my husband. And I, you know, I cried a little bit, but we really, until June of the following year, which was a long time, it suddenly hit me that my dad's gone. And I was, it was really tough. It was really tough then. It was tougher then than when he died. Yeah. Because I was just, I was focused on helping mom then get through losing dad. They've been married 68 years and helping, you know, my siblings get through it, and then helping my husband through his surgery. And so, as a caregiver, I wasn't really letting anyone take care of me. And I think that's probably really important too, that you, if you're a caregiver, you've got to do things and let people be there for you. Even if it's just have some girls, you know, have your friends take you out for a glass of wine or dinner or something, just so you have someone to talk to about it. 
I really didn't do that and I probably should have. Yeah. I'm curious guys, how soon did you inform your family about the cancer? Well, if I can answer, uh, it, it was fairly immediate because I had to go into the hospital. So um, everyone knows that I'm, I'm, I'm fairly active in everything that I do in, in the community, um, socially and, and what have you. So just having to disappear from that, um, the, the, the word traveled not only you know, quickly to, to my, my family, but to friends and even further out in the community you know, amongst uh, parishioners. Um, they, they didn't all necessarily know what the particular cancer was or what the, the health ailment was, even if it was cancer, but they did know that something was going on. So uh, it, it was a little difficult to try to control that. You know? I have a personal reason for asking that question. Go My on. husband refused to tell the family, his family about it. I. I I had to pressure him into it because I felt the children needed to know and certainly the siblings needed to know too. Yeah. It took me probably close to nine months to get him to give in and say, okay, well, let's tell them. Yeah. But once we told them they were, they're very supportive and I'm, I'm very happy about that, at least via telephone, yeah. which is about the best we can do. We are going to Thanksgiving with, for, with family this next, this coming month. And we're, I'm excited about that. But you know, the interesting part is his family seems to think that cancer is no big deal. I'm sorry, it is. It is a big deal. I live it. It's a huge deal. Yes. It, it, it's, a, it's a really big deal. Um, our family, we told right away. We, I mean, we're used to, now I don't want to say used to cancer in our family, but used to talking about it. We told our family right away. But really close friends a couple we told but I don't think we've told anyone else or talked about it to anyone else um my mom interestingly enough knew someone who had cancer prostate cancer several years before Andre and she started telling us all the terrible things that could happen and this and that and I was kind of like okay mom okay okay didn't want to really hear all this stuff oh and he won't be you know he'll be peeing all the time he'll have problems with incontinence and all this and I, it's just not something I wanted to hear. And he's been very fortunate with that. He has no problem with that. He, after surgery, um, he, the doctors really well, that we went to the surgeons really well known for that. And he went in weekly and biweekly at first for exercises of different kinds. And they got it. So there's no problems with incontinence with him at all. So that's, that was really good. Whereas mom was saying, well, that was what, you know, embarrassed her friend the most that that was going on. She isn't in a problem. He is. We. He isn't in a problem with that. So that was good. Um, so you know, other than that, we really opted for the surgery rather than the radiation for him, because when they did the biopsy, twenty-two of the probes or whatever it is they send in, <clears throat> they sent it out twenty-four samples. I guess it is found cancer. So. I was really, we were both really afraid that radiation might not, it's, radiation might not get all those little points when they say you can go to different points here and stuff like that to get it. We were a little bit nervous about that. So we opted for surgery right away. And we told our family um, pretty immediately uh, because of the aggressiveness of it, things started moving very quickly as far as exploring treatment op options and surgeries and things like that. Um, we had a lot of options um, off the table for us because of uh, Brian's past surgeries and scar tissue and things like that. So we were really given two options. We were given one option in Boston that didn't have a real uh, high success rate and then we or surgery. And so we went straight into surgery. But it, it, it definitely is hard to tell uh people about it i mean not only are you now hearing yourself saying out loud it makes it very real but now other people know about it as well and it kind of it forces you into that reality of that this is going on you know what i find to be the hardest thing to do is to keep our spirits up yes we try to we try to maintain a positive attitude about it but you can't do it all the time no you just can't. You just have to take a break and say and cry or whatever you need to do to get it out of your system. We tried to watch a lot of funny movies whenever we could. We would tell jokes. We would do 
we would try to get to get, you know, do things a lot with the family. Our, our family is a good support system. So we would, our, and our things we would do annually, we would continue and stuff like that um, around that time. And I think that helped us a lot too. Um, it, it's scary. There's no two ways around it. It's extremely frightening, frightening experience. Not only the surgery, um, it, the surgery itself is frightening, but then not knowing. And I think for me, the worst part is the not knowing, not knowing what to expect, not knowing what the outcome is going to be, not mm -hmm. knowing um, the, like when my daughter had cancer, we were told that she, she had to go in for, to have a shunt put in. And they were told they weren't going to do the shunt if the cancer had gone throughout her body because there'd be no reason to. And this was mm -hmm. on a Tuesday. We were told that. And waited and waited. And the following Tuesday, she went to have the shunt put in. And I took the doctor, the surgeon aside. And I said, you know, we don't want to have the surgery if depending on the results of the test. He says, oh yeah, we got the test. It's not gone through her body. I said, well, when did you have the results? They said, last Thursday. Okay. So yeah. that's when we <laughs> should have the results. Because literally, <laughs> literally, I was, I felt like I was dying a little every day. And I think that if the healthcare industry is, can do anything, they, as soon as they get results, you should have the results of anything. It shouldn't be that you have to wait a week or two. And even waiting for the biopsy, you know, you wait, you, oh yeah, you, you might have cancer. Let's wait eight weeks before we do a biopsy, you know, this type of thing. But that doesn't make sense to me when you're waiting for something for results like that. You want it out and you want it out now. And you're wondering how fast can it move? And our doctor, our surgeon told us afterwards, it was an extremely aggressive form of cancer my husband had. He thought on a scale of one to 10, however they do this, it was a four, it ended up being an eight or nine. And so we were really lucky it did not extend it to other parts of his body. I think Brian and I tried our hardest to um, maintain some semblance of, of positivity throughout this, but it, it, it came to a point where we, we really needed to, to not neglect those other feelings of, of anger and sadness and, mm -hmm. and, and fear. <laughs> and, and we found that the more time that we actually honored those feelings, uh, it, it made the healing journey just that much more, um, that much more special as far as being down in the trenches with somebody that emotionally raw um, and vulnerable and being as angry as we needed to be, as afraid, as sad as, as we needed to be. And um, I even got Brian some journals, I believe it was like four or five, and each journal had a different emotion on it. And he filled those journals up very quickly. Hmm. And so I, I think that's that's really important when, at least when we were going through this journey was no emotion, uh, however intense, was off the table. Mm -hmm. and, and you all have had uh, somewhat of a different caregiver experience than I have. Again, mine would have been a, a parental relationship. And you all have um, uh, partners work. Are there any challenges with, um, I, I guess you could say the elephant in the room, things that you uh, struggled with talking about with, with your partners? Oh, yes. Okay. Lots of them. Lots of challenges. The biggest is his lack of libido. He has no interest in sex anymore. And unfortunately, I do. So we've had to work through all kinds of issues and figure out ways to get around it because his system doesn't work anymore. But the worst part is mentally, he has no interest in sex anymore. And that's the part that I have hard for hard time with because I still need the intimacy the physical intimacy, not just the mental and emotional intimacy, which we've always been close uh, to each other on that, but the physical intimacy is what I miss. And I have to initiate all the physical intimacies. He still engages, he just has no real um, urge to begin anything. That part I miss badly. And I know I'm old, but I'm not that old. Sex is important, I think, no matter what the age is. And I think it is important that, that we do talk about it. Um, it Brian, the, the unique situation with him was he's, he was so young. I mean, he was 37 when, mm -hmm. when he got this diagnosis. And so it was a pretty open and frank conversation that we had to have as far as 
what that physical intimacy, what it was going to look like. It wasn't going to be uh, worse necessarily. It was going to be just different. And so mm-hmm. making sure that we were reassuring each other that uh, it wasn't what physical intimacy was like before the surgery and then what it was like after the, the surgery. Um, it was just a new way of, of doing it. And, and, and that was, that was really hard. And, and, and I got to give props to Brian. He was more open-minded um, as far as uh, ideas and, and what we should try. Um, it, it's not that I was closed-minded to it. Um, I, I was a little nervous to bring it up just as far as um, how would, how would he feel about that? I knew he was already struggling with, um, with how he, he felt about it. So, so for him to initiate a lot of those, what about this? Let's try this. Let's look at this, um, conversations, uh, really helped. And, and I think there are so many other different kinds of, of intimacy, uh, Regina, like you were saying, as far as emotional intimacy, intellectual intimacy, and, and that sort of thing. And, and to ensure that all of those areas of intimacy are getting checked off and they are getting um, uh, paid attention to. You know what we started doing as part of our intimacy? We started engaging and completing our bucket lists, which is fabulous. And I highly recommend it. If you have, don't have a bucket list, create one and start doing them. We actually did something this summer that he wanted to do that blew me out of the water because this is not up his alley. We went to something called Burning Man in the Desert in the <laughs> Fabulous, fabulous. A week in the desert fighting sandstorms and looking at art creations of art. Best thing we've done in years. Love it. So if you get a chance, go. Okay, I'm, I'm writing that one down. <laughs> I've heard a lot about that, so yeah. <laughs> Any uh, discussion on other outlets? I know you'd said um, movies, uh, happy movies to kind of give you a little better outlook on on things yeah, or make the situation a little happier. And any others besides, you know, support groups and different things? And then just well, I may, I may be hemiplegic, which means half of me is paralyzed, but I love to go do things physically. So I go, I go exercise, I use the machinery, I take walks, we go places, we visit things, we go to the museums, we do whatever we can to get out of the house. And I try to move as much as I can in order to stay as healthy as I can, because that's how I've survived 23 years. I, I really think that the any kind of exercise or any kind of like that and, and eating right really helps with, with any kind of illness, but cancer specifically. Uh, my husband walks five miles a day. I don't, but he wow. does. And <laughs> well, usually five to six times a week. We really love the game. And we've got a good, a lot of people in the pickleball group um, have supporters through different things. I'm deaf. Um, you probably don't know that because I'm talking to you, but Last year I had surgery and I had cochlear implants on both sides. And so when we were, when I had, was turned on so that I could hear, the the audiologist said to my husband, is there anything you want to say to her? And he looked at me and he says, I love you. It was the first thing I've heard him say that in 20 years. So, because I couldn't hear before. So it was really, really nice. And so our friends in pickleball help us with things like that. They'll stop the game, say, Gail, do you hear that? That's a, you know, that's a helicopter (laughs) Those are ducks going by. So that way we have a good support group with a lot of things. I don't think most of them know I'm, my husband had prostate cancer because we started playing pickleball after that. And that's just not something that we necessarily bring up a discussion. You know, that's the interesting thing about cancer. You can't tell. You generally can't tell. So it's up, up to us whether we want to share it with it or not, which is not a bad thing, I think. I think if there's one blessing with this diagnosis is it really helped us slow down and be in the moment instead of being lost just in the the, the daily gray grind that is our daily lives um, and just enjoying each other's company. We and, and, and COVID had a lot to do with this as far as working from home, but it, we every 
day we would find a new recipe and we would just get the ingredients to make it um, and, and just finding you know, creative ways just to enjoy each other. But I think it's, mm-hmm. it's also important to have as far as that healing autonomy to have your own separate uh, outlook. Um, there are so many times uh, as a caregiver, I felt marginalized where uh, you know people would ask, oh, how's Brian doing? And then didn't ask how, how, how I was doing. And uh, it got to the point where you know, my updates with Brian almost sounded scripted as far as what I was telling them and how, and how he was doing. Um, so I'm a big advocate for honoring that, that you are involved in this uh, process too. That there are two people going through this uh, journey together and to be able to have a separate um, support outside of that. I mean, obviously, uh, Brian and I were there, we supported each other uh, through and through, but to have somebody who wasn't as close to the situation call and say, let's go grab lunch. And for an hour, we're not going to say anything medical. We're going to talk about anything else uh, besides that. I I found that to be very important to have that, that separation. I would want, I would agree with you, Stacy, on that. I know that the only person that asked how I was doing through it was my sister and everybody else. Well, how's Andre? How's Andre? And, and that was good. And he was going, he's going through a lot, but you know what? I'm going through a lot too. Yes. And it's hard. It's a very, you know, people time. forget about the caregivers. Nobody's ever asked me how I'm going through it. Nobody. Yeah. And I feel a little bit lonely because of that. It's hard because you feel you don't resent caring for the person at all, but it's such, it's so emotionally difficult thing to go through. Mm-hmm. And um, you, you feel like you're losing part of you when you go through it. Absolutely. So the idea, uh, that Stacy said about going out with someone and doing that. I would like, I would have liked if someone said, let's just go out to lunch. Let's go do this. And either talk about it or not talk about it, forget about it for an hour and a half if you want to, or, or not talk about it. Now, my neighbor just lost her daughter to cancer. And um, now that I'm thinking about this, I should probably do the same to her. I should probably call her up and say, you don't want to talk, you want to get together. We can talk about her or not talk about her. They, they literally always talk about her, either on Facebook or, or to, to us and stuff like that. And I think they feel the need to, so I don't know. But I think as caregivers, a lot of times um, you're, you're going through such emotional, difficult things. And it seems like you're almost going through it alone because you don't want to say too much to the person you're caring for because you don't want to bring, you want to buoy their spirits up, not down. Mm-hmm. I think it's really hard. And I've been the caregiver for three people in my family so far. Hopefully that's all. I think there is a great deal of emotional numbing uh, that that I went through as as a protective factor. Like, like you said, there was so much going on. I could see just how much it was it was uh, affecting Brian. And, and, and don't get me wrong, there were plenty of times where there was no holding back how I felt about it. You know what I said and and, and things like that. Um, but it, it took some reflection just how checked out I was. I think for the especially the first year. Um, as far as knowing that, that, that it was okay to, to be honest about how I was doing and it was okay to not be okay. And Brian was very supportive of that. I never felt as though, uh, I was dismissive in, in, in any way about how I felt. Um, so it was more keeping myself in line keeping myself in check that, that it was okay to do this. And Stacy, you're particularly younger than us. And so I'm not sure if there's, I don't know, my husband and I had already had so many years together before we started going through this. You couldn't have been married very long when everything started happening. Well, we, when we first started dating, um, I, I was already aware of, of the, the Lynch syndrome. And so I knew, you know, from, from day one, there was, you know, medical, um, complexities with it. Um, 
he had several bowel obstructions because of, of the colon cancer and, and the complexities and, and, and all of this. But yeah, 2019 was my first experience from day one with the cancer diagnosis um, and, and then moving forward. And you, you really learn a lot about each other. I mean, we took our wedding vows seriously, but I, it, it really uh, showed the, the rhythm of the resiliency in our relationship when we were, when we were going through this. Um, I, Brian credits a lot of that to a support group that he's a part of, the, the PC tribe. I want to give a shout out to them. Um, but it's, it really, um, it really helped. It really helped us. It was, it was tough to go through, but I don't think we've ever been closer. I, I think that's one thing that grit is really good with that. There are other people you can find that have gone through similar experiences and you can connect with them and you can talk to them if you want to about what you're going through. Pastor, are you married? Uh, no, that's why I didn't have that. Uh, okay. That partner well, to, to support, but you know, if, if you're trying to fix me up, you you can work on that. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll... I, I didn't know if uh, if something had happened because of, if you I don't know. I have I have someone I know very well um, that I'm related to who's when he, they found out he had can when his wife found out she had, he had cancer, she says, I didn't sign up for this. And she left. That was it. She yeah. Found out. I, I had a unique dating situation that was going on at the time. It, I already had some issues already. So when this happened, it, it did fizzle. Um, but you know, it, it, there's a lot of debate on if that was the reason why or not, but it, it very well could have contributed as well. But um, folks, I want to thank you all for sharing. Uh, we have about five minutes. <laughs> and I wanted to, um, I guess, end this session with, is there anything specific that you wanted our audience to, to take home from this uh, particular session? So we, we can just go quickly around and I, I guess eat up our five minutes. I can't believe this whole <laughs> time has gone by so fast. But uh, we'll start with you, Gail, and then we'll go to Stacy, then Regina. I guess I would, the two things I would say if someone's going through it is if you can go through it with someone to the appointments and that so that they can be there for you and copy down things, it's really, really important. And if a family's going through it, don't forget the caregiver. Um, you know, ask the family, ask the caregiver out for lunch, ask them to get away and say, do you want to talk about it? Or if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine. Let's just get out of get away for a little while. I think that'd be an important thing to say. Even if you did it, I mean, because it, it, it can be a very ongoing, long process. And so if it was done, you did it every couple of months or something, that would be great for the person. Okay. All right, Stacy. It's so important to, to recognize the value that you bring in, in this healing relationship as far as being uh, a caregiver. I think you can lose a lot of your identity just with all the diagnosis and and your spouse having that. So uh, just knowing that you play an incredibly crucial role uh, in this and you're not to be uh, ignored. And so you have a voice uh, and it definitely deserves to be heard. Thank you. And uh, Regina. Only recommendation is as frightening as cancer can be, live your life. You're still alive. Do the things you want to do. Fulfill your bucket list and enjoy it the best you can. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so you've all contributed a great deal. I think uh, our audience should get quite a bit out of this. Um, I actually got quite a bit out of it. And uh, I hope my contribution <laughs> was, was uh, mutual as well. Um, I don't know if I, Allie has anything to have yes, thank you. I wanted to just say thank you. You folks shared your lives and your experiences with us. And I think there was so much to learn and, and take from what you said. Just thank you so much for your time and being a part of our community. Um, so with that, you know, thank you to everyone who's watching this and we'll see you all soon. Thank you so all right. much.